Hello again. In this podcast, I just wanted to talk about uh, Egypt, which is one of my favorite places. And it's um, one of those places that I've been fascinated with since I was very young. Um, That goes back to my interest in history and ancient civilizations. And obviously, the Egyptian civilization goes back about 4,000 plus years. So there's an awful lot of history there. And I, I guess on that subject, uh, on that note, there is one area where I realized when I last went, so I've been there twice so far, the last time was in 2013, and I realized either on that trip or as I was getting there that I, although I have some understanding of the ancient dynasties and kind of to a very rough degree who followed who, I was remarkably ignorant about the more recent history and that got brought home a little bit because at one stage, on that occasion, I was on uh, uh, just taking a cruise with some friends around the Mediterranean, the Eastern Mediterranean, and we stopped in, um, we'd actually gone into the port of um, Alexandria in the north and had taken uh, a car or a kind of minibus, took us into Cairo. Uh, My friend had organized uh, various trips for us. And We were, so we were only in Cairo one night and we got into Cairo, it took a few hours to get down and there were already petrol restrictions and um, travel restrictions in place. So I I can't remember if this one related to the number of the vehicle registration, um, if you, if it was odd numbers one day and even numbers the next, but um, there were a lot of checkpoints and military vehicles at the checkpoints, which, you know, is always an attention grabber and, um, pretty chaotic at times. Uh, Anyway, we'd got in, we'd been out late, we'd been to a large mosque, which was brilliant actually. Um, My friend and I had already been in it, whereas his wife and mother-in-law, who were also with us, uh, they hadn't seen it. So they went into the ladies' section and we were outside just chatting and some young lads came up who were um, wanting to sell us bread and other things. And we ended up having a chat, and I was joking about being Australian with them, and they disappeared, and then they came back again. And um, we really had a good time with them. And I guess one thing I would like to say is that if you are somewhere like that, and I've also experienced this in different places in Africa, once you get past the tourist hotspots, if you're prepared to chat to some of the lo- local people, and I've definitely seen tourists who just stay away from local people. They they get obsessed about being mugged and all this sort of thing, which obviously does happen. And uh, you, you have pickpockets and all of that. So you need to take a little bit of care. But if you do chat to local people, and particularly I find kids in particular, they're really curious about you and what your life is like. And um, I do remember an aside really going to Kenya And we'd stopped at a petrol station to just get petrol and buy some snacks. And I was chatting to this little lad and he asked where I was from. And I said, I was from London. And his comment was, ah, BBC World Service. So I'm just going back into the 80s. But, you know, do engage with kids because it can be very rewarding. And some of them are absolutely lovely. And obviously, you need to stay aware when you're in any city. And this goes, you know, I'm living in... France at the moment, and that would certainly go be, hold very true for Paris, for London, places like that. You still get pickpocketed and all this sort of stuff going on. But take some precautions, but don't let that get in the way of connecting with local people. So um, the, the young guys in Cairo were absolutely hilarious, and they did come back, and one of them asked if I remembered his name, and of course <laughs> I was struggling with that, but they were just great fun. And so that, that was really the point about that, to... Um, do, do try and mix with the local people and don't try, don't just stick rigidly to the the tourist kind of circuit. Or if you, if you are in the tourist areas, at least have a little chat with, with some of the people. Look, not all of them are going to be chatty, but some of the, the kids in particular I've found are just great fun. Um, so, yeah, I was talking about knowing recent history and usually this trip was unusual because I hadn't organized it. I was just meeting people who pretty much organized the trip for me. And I hadn't really done any research other than I knew Egypt a little bit anyway from a previous visit. And I was just up for a break and I hadn't done a cruise before and I quite enjoyed it. 
Um, <laughs> being 2013 though, uh, we were there in Cairo the two days before the, um, I don't know what you would call it, the revolution or whatever it was that kicked off in Cairo. So I was there two days before it actually happened. And, and I believe it started in, I think it's Tahrir Square in um, Cairo. Well, I remember we'd been out, some, I think it was where we'd been at this mosque where we met these kids and we were then being driven back to our hotel and it was dark. We'd been out on the Nile on a boat trip on the Nile, all the touristy stuff. And um, as we were in the minibus going back to the hotel, all the traffic was getting funneled down to these checkpoints going into the square. And my American friends are a bit nervous about what was going on. I mean, I was kind of not happy about it, but then I was thinking, well, nothing's actually kicked off when we're tourists. And usually, um, and if, and if, as long as nothing's actually happened, to it, you're probably okay as a tourist. I don't want to involve tourists because it, it can create a, a, a put things in negative light. What they're trying to do. So it was all good. We got through and um, stayed in a lovely hotel. Um, unfortunately, I didn't really get to appreciate it, and I, I can't remember which one it was. Now I think it was one of the Mercure hotels um, close to the river. But we got there quite late. It was completely dark, and then we were up first thing in the morning to get off to the pyramids and we actually went to the step pyramid at Takara which is another amazing place and I had I was going to say the dubious distinction but I had the distinction of being the first person to go inside the pyramid that particular morning and I do remember we were the only vehicle there the guys had just kind of unbolted or whatever the, the sort of wooden door they had over the, um, the, the, the passageway that leads down inside the pyramid and um, naturally, he took my camera. <laughs> I wasn't switched on enough to hide it or hide a camera and um, get some pictures inside. But it was quite strange. So first of all is I'm not great in confined spaces. I think I'm getting worse as I get older. And if you've been inside these pyramids, there's a long um, access tunnel, which is from memory at about 45 degrees. It's a reasonably steep angle, um, not that high. So, um, and I'm not tall, and I was sort of bent over a little bit. And getting down inside there, there were two large chambers. So the this tunnel took you down into the main chamber, and then there was another um, kind of passageway, uh, which involved getting up some scaffolding from memory and then going into this other chamber. And the thing that I most remember, I mean, they're, they're amazing going inside the pyramids and looking at how they built them with this rock, and it was they're just amazing structures. So if you're able to handle confined spaces sometimes with an awful lot of people in them then I would recommend it but just remember that it's not that easy to get in and out or particularly get out if you're getting a bit nervous by the confined space but I went into the first chamber and it was it was quite stuffy in there but it, it was sort of okay and I was looking around and then I kind of nipped into the second one because I, I do I'm not one of these people who spend hours looking at stuff generally and um, the air inside the second chamber was pretty bad it didn't it felt very, it was kind of musty, it wasn't good, didn't feel like it had an awful lot of oxygen in it, and um, I, I just thought, no. <laughs> so I, I was really in there for just a few minutes and then decided I was going to enjoy some fresh air. So, um, but Saqqara is an amazing pyramid to see if you get to, uh, get to visit it. Um, that morning we also went to the the main pyramid site of the the, the main pyramids and the sphinx that everybody knows at Giza and um, again this was at a time where and I, I guess people were a bit more switched on maybe about the local situation tourism had really been hit so there were very few tourists about so the downside of that was that all of the kind of hawkers people selling things were picking on us a little bit um, equally, you've got to feel for them a bit because a lot of them, that's their how they make their money. And once the tourists go, and I've also seen this in Zimbabwe and Victoria Falls is very conscious of it and I was there. It's very, very hard for them. And they do become a nuisance. You know, you, you, I'm always trying to be polite, uh, but I certainly reach a point sometimes where I just have had enough. Um, but the people there were fine. And I do vividly remember this um, little girl who was, trying to sell these um, bookmarks and she was kind of going after us and we were leaving the we'd been you know going around the whole area for probably an hour or so and we were leaving now to go back to our minibus and then actually drive back up to alexandria to pick up the ship 
and uh, she'd been working her way through our group and I honestly didn't want this stuff that she had but when she came to me I just said oh look here you go look, I don't really want anything but here's, here's five pounds whatever the money was and um, to be fair to her and I, I, I kind of thought about this a lot afterwards she absolutely insisted and actually stuffed these bookmarks in sort of between my arm and my body and then ran off <laughs> and, I, and I realized that I although I thought I was doing the right thing because I didn't really want this stuff but I wanted to help her out it's actually quite disempowering and quite a negative thing to do. It's not respectful to do that. And she deserved that, that respect to sell me something, have a commercial transaction and get money that way. Sell goods, make money. Maybe she even had to report it to somebody. I don't know. So I guess the reason I'm relating this story is that if you do find yourself in that kind of a situation, even if you don't want it, uh, I, I would suggest paying what for us is a small amount of money. You know, as a tourist, you're going to get targeted. I mean, and then you're going to get ripped off and all this sort of stuff. So um, I don't worry about that anymore. When I travel, I just take that as part of the experience. And the fact is, I can afford it. Um, I can afford to spend a few extra pounds, euros, dollars, whatever it is, to uh, to buy something from somebody who, to them, that money might be, um, you know, you know, the difference between having a meal or not that day. So. That was another point about that. Um, I also wanted to talk about heading further south. So I, on that particular trip in 2013, I only went as far south as Cairo. Um, it was a kind of bounce from Alexandria down to Cairo and then back up to Alexandria to pick up the ship. On the previous trip, I'd gone from Cairo all the way down to Luxor, Edfu and Aswan. And... Um, that that was amazing, and I'm, I'm trying to remember now. Part of it was in a, on a Fluka, which is one of these uh, boats that they have up and down the Nile. Which are, uh, it's a sailing boat, so it has a sail, obviously. And they also have these oars, which have got to be the most inefficient oars <laughs> I've ever seen because they're like a long piece of wood, you know, two by four or something. There's no flaring at the end like you would have in a regular oar. And um, I do remember at one stage. We were rowing the fluka to get it to where we needed to be for uh, whether it's to kind of park up for the night or uh, whatever it was for. But this, and we all had to go at rowing, you know, just help out and being a boy, <laughs> do do my do my bit. Um, yeah, it was really inefficient, and um, but a, a great experience again on the fluka. Um, so I'll talk a bit about that. We, um, I think, we were only a few nights on it, and we slept out on deck. We had. Um, I think I can't remember blankets or sleeping bags or whatever, but we had, you know, we were sleeping on deck and it was really nice. It was just beautiful under the stars. We were lucky with the weather. Um, our, and then um, I think it was the second night we pulled up by um, a sandbank. We'd moored up and another boat pulled up not far from us. And it just had the the boat master, I guess you'd call him, and um, and. Um, a boy, so I don't know if it was his son or somebody learning the ropes, but anyway, they came over to our um, boat and they had, I think it's a haka, the, the smoky thing, the, you know, you see them in the, the, the Middle East a lot, and um, we had one of those on the boat, and I was just trying this stuff, we were all trying this stuff, and they, they have different flavoured kind of, I don't know if it's tobacco, but I, hadn't, I remember an apple one, you know, and it's fun doing that, and then... Um, the uh, one of the, one of the people on our trip had some whiskey, and there was a lot of bonhomie going on with um, uh, whiskey being passed around and drinking toast and what have you. And then they put something different in the in the hucker. <laughs> so I don't know what that was, but I don't remember much. I don't remember a lot of the night after that. So um, the following morning, I did end up jumping in the Nile just to um, try and wake myself up and uh, had a little swim to. Uh, um, sober up a bit as well so that was fun and that kind of brings me back a little bit to the Aswan Dam and that's one of the good things about the Aswan Dam is that I believe I'm right in saying that there are no crocodiles in the lower part of the Nile now at least not uh, certainly not in the area we were in because that would have been a problem years ago um, because obviously the Nile crocodile lives in the Nile among other places it's a big um the very large crocodile species. Uh, if you know anything about the um, more recent Egyptian history, 
I'm going to only go back to 1960, but the Aswan High Dam was put together by President Massa and it started in 1960. And the idea was to set up hydroelectric power, for one thing, and also stop the seasonal flooding of the Nile. And um, again, if you know the history of that region, the Nile Delta and the um, the banks on the side of the Nile are very, very fertile. And it's because of this regular flooding of the Nile. It, it um, put a quite rich soil on the edge of the Nile. And if you've flown over the Nile, if you look down on it, you I've, I've done this, and you can see the line of the river. There are very green and lush kind of banks on either side, and then everything else is desert. So it's a, quite a strange place to see. However, um, back in 1960, the um, Aswan and High Dam was put in. But the problem was that was going to flood one of the ancient temples, um, the Temple of Abu Simbel, which is uh, was built by Ramesses II, who was pretty good at self-promotion and um, I think exaggerated one or two of his victories and uh, his actual involvement in them, but one of the more famous pharaohs. And that was an amazing place to see. So if you get and that was actually moved kind of stone block by stone block and relocated uh, to preserve this temple um, ahead of the dam being built and then the, the area behind the dam obviously flooding. Um, the Another thing I just wanted to talk about was Rosetta Stone, which was, I can't know, I should have checked where that was found. But again, um, I kind of wanted to mention it because it was discovered uh, around 200 years ago and a guy, Jean-Francois uh, Champollion, was um, with the original, one of the French expeditions, so 1822 is when he, um, when the, the Rosetta Stone was discovered, and this obviously now postdates Napoleon, but Napoleon um, originally invaded Egypt in uh, the 1790s, uh, I believe I'm right, so in around 1800, because uh, that was the Battle of the Nile, where the French fleet was destroyed by uh, Nelson. And um, that group of essentially abandoned soldiers did go to Cairo, uncover the Sphinx, and you'll see a lot of graffiti where they carved their names in. But there was subsequent, ex uh, that seemed to have started the interest in um, ancient Egypt from a modern perspective. And um, Jean-Francois Champollion was very involved in understanding the, the old Egyptian culture. And what the, Rosetta, the importance of the Rosetta Stone was that nobody could understand the hieroglyphs. And then the Rosetta Stone was found and it was written, it was, um, I think, a decree but it was written in three languages or in three scripts. It was written in ancient Egyptian and ancient Greek. And the ancient Egyptian part was in hieroglyphs and demotic, which is like a, like a more handwritten script rather than the uh, sort of pictorial script of the hieroglyphs. And because people could read ancient Greek, they were able to translate the um, demotic and the, the hieroglyphs. So that was a really important discovery. So um, I'm going to wind it up there. I am possibly rambled a bit again, but I, I just wanted to share some of the experience of Egypt because if you get a chance to go, I really do recommend it, if you, particularly if you're interested in ancient history. But do sort of brush up on some of the more recent stuff as well. Uh, I say that as much as a criticism of myself because I think it's really disrespectful of local people not to know their more recent history. <laughs> it's all very well rocking up knowing their ancient history, but you know, it's kind of nice. It's like learning, trying to learn a few words of their language. And I'm absolutely hopeless at languages, but I'll always have a go and um, try and work my way through. So there you go. I hope you found that interesting. And um, yeah, if you get a chance to go on the Nile on a fluke, I'd recommend it. It's quite an experience. It's a lovely way to see the Nile. It's really relaxing. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, enjoy. So I will speak to you next time. Bye for now. I hope you enjoyed that podcast. Now, if you did and um, you're interested in wildlife photography or really a basic introduction to photography, I suppose, my next free webinar is taking place on Wednesday, the 31st of January. That's at 7 p.m. Central European time, so Paris time. And um, it doesn't really matter if you can't make the live event because everybody who registers, so once you register, I get your email address. 
Uh, once the webinar has finished, normally one or two hours later, um, you will get uh, um, an email from me with a link to the recording. So uh, if you're not able to make the live event, if you're in Australia or somewhere else, that shouldn't be a problem. So that's on uh, Wednesday, the 31st of January. And there's a link in the description. It's on Eventbrite. And um, you can also find it on my website. So if you go to the website, you'll find the link there. Uh, and www.ge.photography should take you there. Okay, speak to you soon. Bye now.